Well, good afternoon and welcome to our Naval Institute annual meeting. This is our 145th year and our first order of business. <laughs> now that we've gotten everybody to sit down is to stand up and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I welcome all our members who are here with us tonight. This is our premier member event in Washington. I welcome all our board members from our board of directors, our foundation board of directors who we call trustees, our Naval History Advisory Board members, and all the guests who are here, and all the staff who are here, and I hope we get some great interaction tonight. Um, we're very fortunate to have, as the chair of our board of directors, a person who embodies the values of our organization. He's wrote and published at every commissioned rank. He published over 40 articles and proceedings and six Naval Institute press books. So without any further ado, I introduce our chair of the board, Admiral Retired Jim Stavridis. Well, hello everybody. Uh, thank you all for turning out. I think we see the edges of the Washington summer coming our way, but uh, it's still lovely and pleasant and spring-like out there. Um, too many friends in this audience to acknowledge individually, but I look forward to catching up over a glass of wine with uh, so many friends. The, I think the, the lucky thing for me is not having written at every commissioned rank. The lucky thing for me are the friendships that developed through this organization, so many of which are manifested in the the friendly faces out here tonight. Um, what I traditionally try and do at this is is talk for, I don't know, Pete, what about 45 minutes? Uh, I'll kind, of, kind of get people warmed up. Now, uh, I, I just want to make an observation about the year since we were, many of us, here in this very location. And thank you to CSIS for letting us uh, use this absolutely marvelous facility. When I look back on the year, um, First, I think of the tragedies of our uh, destroyers at sea and 17 sailors lost. Um, that, I think, is with all of us, and we, we think about that as a profession. On the other hand, in the course of this year, we saw destroyers of that class in triumph, l launching exceptional tomahawk strikes, along with other allies and partners and friends and submarines and so on. But I think for that destroyer force, which has been obviously so much a part of my life, um, it's been a year of highs and lows. And so I think a fundamental thing for this group is to help us understand what happened, what we can do to continue to improve as we wrestle with those big issues, because that's what the Naval Institute does. Secondly, our, our Marines, I've had the Marines in my mind a lot this year because my son-in-law, who's a Navy physician, flight surgeon, is forward deployed with the Marine Helicopter Squadron. He's in Okinawa, but they've been at sea, they've been in Korea much of the deployment, and so I watch the events even more closely perhaps than I would otherwise, such is the case when you really have skin in the game. And I think a lot about Marines and their worldwide deployment. And I grew up in a Marine Corps family, went to Quantico High School. And so when I think of our Marines this year and their readiness for what may come in Korea, in Syria, in Europe, in Asia, I'm very proud of our Marines. And thirdly, uh, we always talk about our sea services, the Coast Guard. I, I see Sally Bryce O'Hara here. I promised I wouldn't recognize anybody individually, but I can't resist, Admiral. Um, earlier this week, I took a tour up in Boston of Coast Guard Cutter Seneca, 
which is a, a very venerable ship, a uh, 278, correct me, Admiral, if I'm wrong there, uh, beautiful, but a ship that sailed so often through Latin America and the Caribbean, and I was invited to tour her as part of uh, Southern Command and talking about that region of the world, and it reminded me how everywhere in the world you see the Coast Guard, and they forward deploy, and they internally deploy into our rivers and our bays and our harbors. And so the Coast Guard and its role has been much in my mind. And then lastly, uh, Friday last, I was in Vallejo, California, and gave the commencement address and commissioned uh, the young men and women of Cal State Maritime, the California Maritime Academy. And uh, they graduate about 225 who all go into the oceans, either at sea as merchant mariners, they run ports, they run transportation grids. It reminded me that it's, it's not just the Navy, the Coast Guard, the Marine Corps. Our merchant marine sailors are an enormous part of this. And really, in the end, the reason for all this is to keep those oceans a global commons for us all. So it's been a very full year for these sea services. I'm very proud to continue as the chair of the board here. We have a spectacular board, many of whom are here today. And I look forward to renewing many, many friendships, but above all hearing in a few moments from our award winners, our writers, our chief of naval operations. And I'll just close by recognizing one other individual in the room, my very good friend, John Greenert previous Chief of Naval Operations. John, it's great to see you here as well. So to all of you, I say welcome, thank you, and Pete, let's get the annual meeting underway. Well, thank you, Admiral Stavridis. Well, one of the things that's required as, uh, at the annual meeting is to talk about the state of the Institute, but first I want to thank our sponsors, uh, without whom we wouldn't be able to put on such a wonderful member-focused event. And you can see up here our three sponsors. We have our flagship sponsor, USAA, who's represented here tonight by um, Master Chief Retired, Force Master Chief Retired uh, Ronnie Wright uh, with USA Military Affairs. Uh, champion sponsor, Leonardo, who's recognized by senior VPs Mike Coulter and Joe Militano, and Lockheed Martin, who's represented here tonight by Captain Retired uh, Robbie Harris. So we thank them, and let's give a hand to our sponsors. Um, per, our, per our bylaws, we're required to discuss the state of the Institute, and I'm happy to report that the state of the Institute is good, and uh, we continue to make excellent progress on our strategic plan and delivering the mission outcomes, but also doing it in a sustainable fashion. And uh, we're in the black for the fifth year in a row. Uh, we finished 2017 with a very strong bottom line of $1.3 million to the good. We finished with over 50,000 members. And also, again, our foundation um, had a record a record year in 2017. And the sole purpose of the foundation is to support the Naval Institute. There's nothing else there. Its sole purpose is that. Um, and we've got a picture here, and uh, Jim, Admiral Stavridis mentioned uh, the Merchant Marine. So one of the things that made us successful in 2017 was William Shea Hassler, who gave us an extremely generous bequest and this gentleman is a merchant. He was in the Merchant Marine in the San Francisco area. He was an engineer. He was an avid reader and consumer of our Naval Institute Press books and uh, proceedings. And uh, he left us this very generous gift. And in recognition of his generosity, we'll be giving sponsored student membership to the cadets at Cal Maritime in his name, and we're looking forward to establishing an event in the San Francisco Bay Area in the future that's part of our next tranche of development. And he's also, be he's also going to be remembered in Beach Hall with an appropriate plaque. 
but uh, an example kind of humbling that a man would get to the end and say, I'm for these guys in a big way. Okay, so another thing that we have to report real quick is to our board of directors, a uh, very impressive group, and I'm happy to say that I think most of them are here, Admiral Dad Allen is here, he's hiding out in left field over there, but he's here. Uh, these are the new ones I'm highlighting in, in bold here are the newly elected members, Mr. Philip Bilden, um, Admiral Greenert, who's already been recognized, Admiral Peg Klein, uh, Commander Guy Snodgrass, who works for, for Secretary Mattis, and the Honorable Bob Work, who's also Colonel Bob Work, USMC retired. And I always think of it as, you know, back in the day, uh, Captain Stavridis and Colonel Work worked together in the Secretary's office. And our advisors are listed there. You know, we can't have, we can't have voting directors be active duty uh, flag and general officers, but these advisors do important work for us. Uh, thank you to our departing board members. Um, this is a six year, the, everybody on that list up there did six years voluntarily without compensation and did a lot of heavy lifting. And to make a lot of the progress, they were essential in making a lot of the progress that'll be reflected in this briefing tonight. But uh, Admiral Dan Bowler, Chip Gregson, uh, Carl Hassinger, Vince Patton, Gordon Van Hook, um, all did incredible work to help move the institute. Um, each year also, we elect nine members of the editorial board. We also have some appointed members of the ed board because we try to balance service and warfare communities. But you can see up there in bold, the newly elected members, which is required in the preliminaries here, uh, Colonel Glenn Butler, USMC, Major Mike Lippert, USMC, and Captain Greg Stump, US Coast Guard, to join an editorial board who's done essential work. And you know, as Fred Rainbow likes to say, we really have like a little focus group on every article, and we have that luxury because we have the people who are shown here doing that and also they're doing the heavy lifting on the essay contest, as I mentioned. We wanna say, uh, say thank you to the following Ed Board members whose terms are up in the past year. Lieutenant Colonel Amy McGrath, USMC, Sergeant Major Dave Maddox, Commander Brian Schmickless, US Coast Guard, and Lieutenant Commander Jeff McLean, uh, Navy test pilot. Okay, so now for the trustees, um, not a lot of change on the trustees, but we had one very important addition. Uh, Ms. Marty Thompson Rodemaker, who's here tonight, joining us from Mason City, Iowa, as a new member of the trustees. And I uh, also want to thank Dan Bowler. Per the bylaws, we have one board member who's hostage over on the trustees and has to report back, and Dan Bowler also did that. I want to acknowledge his contribution there as well. And uh, we just finished this afternoon our 2018 Naval History Advisory Board meeting. Um, I get a lot out of these meetings with John Hattendorf, James Hornfisher, Nick Lambert, Scott Mobley, Craig Simons, and joining us in a couple months for this term will be Dr. Kathleen Broom and uh, our board liaison, Rear Admiral Sam Cox, who's also the commander of the Naval History and Heritage Command. So as I mentioned earlier, we're in the final year of our strategic plan. And it's a three-year plan, and that plan propelled the Institute over the last three years. And we did that on several fronts. We've greatly expanded our reach. We have immensely improved our independent forum. We've increased active duty participation, and we've broadened the engagement for the Institute. I'd say our you know, based on today versus five years ago, we've probably increased the reach of the Institute if you use media metrics by 20 fold. So that's an impressive achievement and uh, a lot of it was propelled by this plan. So Admiral Stavridis alluded to this, but there were some difficult events to watch last year on the naval front and the slide shows all the topics we were talking about. And in, at the Naval Institute, we really felt like those events pushed us to be better. We had to, 
raise our game to deal with the events that were out there because there were a myriad of topics that required accurate reporting in USNI News and the kind of commentary for the independent, open, nonpartisan form of proceedings. Um, you could see here lower left, that's a picture of the Fitzgerald, but it represents a USNI News contribution. And uh, USNI News continues to put up big numbers. And on the right side, uh, life or death in 250 milliseconds, this was an article written by a Marine major test pilot who wrote an article that recommended uh, ground collision avoidance systems be installed on Hornets and Super Hornets. And uh, there were some systems that kind of did that job, especially on the Super Hornet, but uh, he said we should do more. And frankly, when he wrote the article, he got a little pressure because all the Emerald Greener cover your ears, all the programmatic people came out and said, this will result in a mark in Congress because there's a cost avoidance aspect to the article. And he needed some top cover. And Admiral Tim Keating, a member of our board, provided that top cover in the magazine right with the article. And uh, it was super effective. And uh, today, that GCAS program is a program of record in the Marines and is headed towards potentially program of record for the Super Hornet community. And it's that article has been the centerpiece of that discussion. So that's impact. So continuing with that objective, it's about providing better engagement for young leaders. And uh, up in the upper left there, we have our DARE program. Now in the third year, we do it in conjunction with West. And that program is about engaging young people, especially focused on millennials, and finding out what did they think. And then presenting, without a lot of massaging what they think to the person who posed the question. And this year, the person who posed the question was the Commandant of the Marine Corps. And he personally posed the questions. He sat down with them and took the hot wash and then got the full write-up later. And it was just what this program should do. And it was a huge success. Uh, you could see on the upper right is proceedings today. Again, we said last year at this event, we're gonna launch proceedings today. We did it and it's had a huge impact because we're able to talk between the regular print copies of the magazine about what's going on. Lower left, the Chief Petty Officer's Guide is just there as a representation, illustrative purposes for all the professional books because this is about advancing the individual and advancing the profession. And I'm very glad to report that Fleet Master Chief Paul Kingsbury, who's the author of this, is going to come on board and work for us when he retires at the Naval Institute because he's shown incredible skills that we want and we need as a serving naval professional and an E9. And uh, finally, on the, went a little faster, but finally on the lower right, we have uh, some plebes at uh, Beach Hall. And uh, I think I, I might've told this story last year but uh, we wanted to get onto the, we wanted to get into the heads of the plebes at the academy, and they do a facilities tour, and uh, you know they say this is the mess hall, this is the chapel, you know this is where you eat, and we said we're a facility, and uh, and the naval academy bought it, and uh, it was good. So they all come in, and uh, you know they welcome. We found out the winning, the winning formula is to turn the AC down to like 65 degrees and talk to them for just a few minutes and then let them take a nap. <laughs> okay, objective three, again, uh, this is about keeping the lessons of naval history alive for current and future generations. Naval History Magazine is the best of breed. And of course, this objective also includes other primary source history and last year, I was dialing up Golden Life members. I always call the Golden Life members 50 years dues paying. You know, it's pretty, it's pretty epic. So, but the stories you get back from these folks are amazing. And I get this one guy on the phone, uh, Skip Schumacher, you know, okay, Skip, what's your story? And congratulations, and we start talking. And he told me about where he served, and he said I was also on the Pueblo. And I said, wow. And he was the operations officer on the Pueblo during the Pueblo incident. And we published his story, Helen Back, 
in the February edition of Naval History, and you know he's never told his story, and it's really good. Uh, we also said we we're going to do the memoir program, and we did. And uh, you see pictured there on the bottom, Charles Thomas Hibbett. He's a Navy surgeon. He served in the Navy between 1875 and 1913. And he wrote his memoir for his daughter. And it was over 100 years ago that he wrote that memoir. And then as these things sadly so often do, they become lost to time. And then recently, the descendants find this memoir and say, wow, this needs to get you know, attention. It needs to be recorded. And they donated it to our memoir program. And now it's received almost 200 reads on that site. And we feel good about that. It's something we should have done earlier. And, uh, but it's really been excellent to have both the oral history program and the memoir program. And with respect to oral histories, we continue to really work hard to pump out these oral histories. And this year, we've got Admiral Trost, Admiral Johnson, Rear Admiral J. Cohen, Jesse Arbor, who's the last of the Golden 13, Rear Admiral H. Spencer Matthews. Admiral Matthews was an enlisted man, Petty Officer Third Class in 1941, aviation rating. He became an enlisted naval aviator and later became, at the end of his career, a flag officer retired in 1973, and uh, that's a story that needs to be out. And we had it almost all done, and now Paul, I see Paul still on the back. We're going to wrap this one up, because sometimes there was some little glitch that kept us from finishing, whether it was the family's permission or, or something, but uh, we're going back and making sure we get all those out. Objective four is all about broadening our community and increasing our engagement and inspiring others to read, think, speak, and write. And again, the conference engagement's essential. You see upper left there, Kurt Tidd up at the Coast Guard Academy event that we had with Admiral Allen, that Allen, um, in late August. Upper right there is our Applied History Conference. We had a terrific conference uh, on military and politics, Pop proper participation or perilous partisanship. Say that fast 10 times. but. Uh, but also we've got interspersed in here on this slide um, the three examples from the CNO's history essay contest. And uh, upper, upper middle there is Lieutenant John Miller, and he was one of our um, rising historian uh, submissions. He came in first in that category. And at the bottom, they're all in the professional category, but we got Trent Hone's article on Guadalcanal on the left, We've got uh, Dr. Ryan Waddle's article on sea power in the middle. And on the right was the winner, uh, Lieutenant Commander Joel Holwit. And uh, just a super impressive article about recapturing the interwar period strategic magic. And uh, just super well done. And again, uh, we had 292 total entries for this contest. And uh, the essay contest program is strong. We're doing about 14 essay contests right now, and we had 958 total entries last year. 70% of those were active duty. So this is where we're finding uh, our new talent and people who can write. Um, so continuing on this same thing, let's keep going here. Next slide. Uh, the press. So we said last year we're going to get into graphic novels. Everybody was like, really? really. And so we came up with a new imprint that just is for the graphic novels. And uh, it's called Dead Reckoning, as you could see. And in the lower right there, that sepia shot there is an image from the flying column by Carl Potts, who's the author, and uh, Bill Reinhold, who's the um, illustrator. And Carl Potts is the former editor, executive editor, and uh, editor-in-chief at Marvel, and the Flying Column is a fictional story about the real life 1st Cavalry Division in the Philippines in World War II, and the story is inspired by the stories that Carl heard growing up from his grandmother and his father, both of whom were imprisoned during World War II by the Japanese at Santo Tomas. 
The Don Winslow piece up here is kind of cool because uh, Don Winslow was created in 1934 by a naval intelligence officer who had been tasked at the behest of Admiral Watt Cluverius, who himself should be the star in a graphic novel with a name like Watt T. Cluverius. But he wanted a way, Admiral Cluverius told this guy, uh, Martinek, Commander Martinek, I need a way to get to people in the Midwest. I have to reach a bigger audience. And Don Winslow of the Navy first appeared as a series of novels and comics before it became its own radio show and then later became movie serials and uh, film serials. And the success resulted in a serial uh, sequel called Don Winslow of the Coast Guard. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, this became a big deal. And the best of these are being reprinted as part of our uh, graphic novel series. And finally, uh, and Jim Hornfisher was part of our Naval History Advisory Board. He signed on to do Last Stand of the Tin Can Sailors in a graphic novel version um, under our Dead Reckoning imprint. So this is huge progress for us. Next slide. OK, so I had to have one graph. But uh, this just shows you where we are on the foundation. But the most important thing here is not just, it's not the money. It's the fact that this is what is our investment capital of the Institute. And all the things that we've been discussing over the last few minutes start with the foundation. And I'm also very proud to say that we're not taking a lot of corporate money. 85% of the money that we get is from individuals. And the foundation provides the resources to both seize an opportunity and to underpin our ongoing efforts. OK, so I'm at the end here, a couple slides left. We don't have a moment to waste with respect to technology. You know, when I talk to people in industry and in the Pentagon, they often tell you the same thing, that they need their data to be digital, digital findable, usable, and secure. They realize that they have a lot of data that they're not getting sufficient use of, sufficient insights from that data. We have massively digitized. We have shifted to a hybrid cloud already to store and protect our content. And we've organized and taxonomized our data. And 2018 will be the first year where we realize the full benefit of all our efforts. And it's very exciting to see this happen. We've also looked in the ways, and this will be my last real slide before questions. We've also looked in the ways to make Beach Hall a better vehicle for engagement. So we're over there, we're in Beach Hall, we're producing content, but how do we engage better from Beach Hall? And that was a key part of our strategic plan as a, a contributing objective. And uh, we have made terrific progress there, and we're going to fully reveal that plan in the next couple months, but it's very exciting. And uh, I'd like to ask the members of the Naval Institute staff who are here to stand up and be recognized for the progress that's been made. I want to thank them publicly. Finally, we're going to start building our new strategic plan uh, soon. And uh, we hope that to be a five-year plan. It's subject to the board's uh, approval. And uh, that plan, if we did five years, would take us from 2019 to 2023, which is our sesquicentennial. And I think it's good to lay track out to the 150. So that's it. And I wanted to leave some time for questions. And if anybody in the audience has a question, now is the moment. Wow, no questions. Megan, do you have a question? You always have a question. OK, all right. Well then, in that case, we'll move on. And uh, I'll invite Admiral Stavridis to come back up. I think, uh, oh wait, Rick Russell, I'm very sorry. I'm going to ask Rick Russell to come up for presentation of awards. Before we do that,
Thank you. Rick. Thank you, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks, Admiral Daly. I'm Rick Russell, Director of the Naval Institute Press, and it's my pleasure to introduce the Press Author of the Year. This year's winner is Rear Admiral Robert P. Bob Guerrier. Professional publishing uh, has been the bedrock uh, at the Naval Institute and as a press for 120 years. And despite the demands of a distinguished surface warfare career, Admiral Guerrier embraced the warrior ethos early on and rewrote, with Admiral Stavridis, three essential texts, Command at Sea, Watch Officer's Guide, and Division Officer's Guide. The uh, Division Officer's Guide uh, was just published last year. For an encore, Admiral Guerrier was the driving force behind revising and updating the classic Fleet Tactics and Coastal Combat which we're going to publish this summer as Fleet Tactics and Naval Operations. So, for a significant contribution to professional publishing and for this award, please join me in congratulating Admiral Guerrier. Well, first, thanks very, very much. Uh, this is uh, clearly a privilege, uh, and uh, I'll, I just have three brief uh, points to make. Uh, first, uh, my thanks to the leadership at the Naval Institute, uh, all of you, um, for the opportunity to, uh, to contribute. It's a privilege, and we often take that for granted. You make this forum possible in so many different venues to actually contribute to our profession. The second point uh, it is pretty obvious. Uh, I'm accepting this award uh, on behalf of several others. You look at the titles up there, all these works have co-authors, okay? So I would be really remiss if I didn't point out Admiral Stavridis, his inspiration, his encouragement, his content. Uh, Professor Wayne Hughes, who I learned a ton from over the last several months as we worked uh, figuratively shoulder to shoulder on opposite coasts uh, reworking this third edition. And I also want to call out certainly our new contributors uh, in the Division Officer's Guide and are currently hard at work on the Watch Officer's Guide next edition, uh, Jeff Heems and Tom Ogden, both in their post Commander Command tours right now uh, in the Pacific. So watch for those names. You'll be seeing them soon, and they're doing great, great work. And the last point is simply this is all about the next generation. Uh, that's certainly why I do it. And I think uh, it's all about how we help prepare them to be as successful as possible uh, in a very uncertain and turbulent world. And hopefully these works help stimulate ever creative solutions to enduring problems. So thanks very much. Thanks. Hello, I'm Richard Latour, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine. One of the most rewarding parts of my job is publishing articles about underappreciated chapters in sea service history. Over the past five years, many of the best examples in naval history have been written by David Sears. A Navy veteran, David graduated from the University of Pennsylvania, where he completed the Naval ROTC program and received his commission. He subsequently served on board the destroyer USS Gearing and was a member of the operations staff, Commander Naval Forces Vietnam. After leaving the Navy, he worked for more than 30 years as a human resources manager and executive before embarking on a second career writing history. So far, David has written seven articles for naval history. His most recent contribution, a POW's Secret Diary of Captivity is in the current issue. Today, David is being honored for his two articles in the February 2017 issue. Again, a diary plays a key role. 
In this case, the diarist, Ensign William King, endured deprivations while interned in the Soviet Union during World War II. A Naval Institute member had tipped me off about the unpublished diary, and I knew that David could use it as the basis for a terrific feature. We ended up with two superb articles that focus on little-remembered Pacific War events. Flying the Empire Express describes the dangerous recon missions King and other naval aviators flew from the Aleutian Islands across the North Pacific to, the, to Japanese held Kuril Islands. Then Pipeline to Freedom recounts the plight of flyers like King who were forced to land in nearby Russia because of aircraft craft damage or engine problems. Because the Soviet Union and Japan were not yet at war, the aviators were interned before secretly being shuttled along a 6,000 mile pipeline to freedom in Tehran. For his pair of diligently researched and skillfully written February articles, I'm pleased to introduce David Sears as the 2017 Naval History Author of the Year. Thank you. Um, I uh, was first uh, commissioned as a naval ensign uh, more decades ago than I care to count. Um, and I spent four years in the Navy, and then my career took a, a different direction. But in all those years since, uh, I can say with assurance that my pride um, and enthusiasm for the service arm in which I served has, has only grown over the years. And as I get to this stage, and uh, I would say it's probably three or four careers I've had, I'm very grateful that there's an institution like uh, Naval History and an editor like uh, this gentleman um, who has been open to hearing about the type of articles that I'm interested in and the stories that I'm interested in about a service that I greatly admire and have take a great deal of pride in even at this stage of my life. Thank you. I'm uh, Fred Rainbow, and I have the honor of uh, introducing the Proceedings Author of the Year. Uh, the editorial board and the staff came together, had a difficult challenge uh, finding one person to recognize because so many people dared to write and talk about tough issues, and they did. We have more outlets. We have Proceedings Magazine every month. In May, you heard we launched Proceedings Today last year. That's 18 more authors a month. We took over the blog, which is another 18 proceedings authors a month. So we have a lot of people to talk about. So it's going to be very difficult going forward, and it was very difficult this year. Proceedings, which never has an editorial point of view, which is an open forum, truly talks about freedom isn't free. This is the cover of the May issue, which talks about those people who are willing to give their lives, but they're also willing to give their careers. But in the end, an author who truly gave voice uh, to a number of important issues, uh, an author who wrote a regular column for proceedings, charting the course, who wrote for proceedings today, when big issues get small, and in features with proceedings like he did in January with what happened to our surface forces. It is my pleasure and honor to say the winner of this year's contest is Kevin Iyer. One point of personal privilege, uh, when I was executive officer in Antietam, 
Uh, Kevin was our weapons officer and then combat systems officer. And uh, to everything Fred has said about his intellectual qualities, I will add his professional qualities, his ship handling, his leadership, his combat skills are superb. Kevin, I'm so happy to see this. Admiral Daly, um, he contacted me a few days ago and he said, Kevin, we'd like you to say a couple words, but please limit it to about two minutes because I don't want to have to explain what you said to the board again. So I shall try and keep this brief. Um, I recently had the opportunity to read something, one of the first articles I wrote for Proceedings, and it was, it was sobering because it was so bad. I knew that, I read it and I knew that I had something I was trying to say, but I, I could not figure out what it was. But it was real enthusiastic and Proceedings was very nice. And this is the great thing about Proceedings. They want enthusiasm. They want people to share their views, whatever those views are. And it has been a long process, and if I have gotten anywhere decent by this point, I really have to thank the editorial board and the editors of the magazine, particularly Fred Rainbow and Bill Hamlet, and I want to mention Jackie Day, who is Fred's Praetorian guard, who he absolutely could not do it without. Um, I'd also like to recognize Captain Bill Cordell, who has also done a tremendous amount of writing for the magazine this year. Um, I'm absolutely certain that Bill could be standing up here instead of me. I think that would be perfectly fair. And I am a tremendous admirer of his work. I'm envious of his work. Most of all, I want to thank USNI writ large. Um, USNI is unique in all institutions, all institutions in the sense that it is truly an open forum and they want people to write their views about things, sensibly, intelligently share their views. Um, as Fred mentioned, there is no editorial view. One day you can read someone saying that the aircraft carrier is dead and the next day you can read someone saying that, uh, giving an impassioned cry as to why the aircraft carrier is the gold standard of the United States Navy. They also are as fully supportive of the writing of an O-1 as they are an O-10. And that is an invaluable thing also. A lot of times the O-1s, the chiefs, the young enlisted people who have something to say, they are much more courageous than I would be in sharing their views and that is an indispensable thing and what makes the, the institution so great. Uh, most importantly, the USNI invites authors to sensibly rock the boat for the good of the boat. It is my personal opinion that, um, that if there would have been more boat rocking in the past, that um, perhaps we wouldn't have some of the troubles that we're facing today, but that's my opinion. Um, finally, I wish to admire Vice Admiral Daly. Um, in, uh, in my small opinion, it is difficult for Proceedings Magazine to sometimes live up to the courage of its commitment to be a truly open forum. And um, under Admiral Daly, it is my opinion that um, that, that form has come to fullest possible flower. And it is truly an, a, a wonderful thing to see and be part of. It can't be easy. He stands astride two powerful competing ideas, one of which is an unstinting love of the Navy and wanting to support that institution above all else. And another is the, the fact that it's a forum and so it is a powerful tool to hold a mirror up to the institution, even if in that mirror, sometimes we may say, see things that are troubling or that cause us to worry. So um, somehow, Vice Admiral Daly does all that. And for that, um, I'd like to say that um, I am grateful and he is my most admired man. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon. I'm Bill Hamlet. I'm the Deputy Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings. And uh, I have the great fortune today of announcing the winners of the 2017 General Prize Essay Contest. Since 1879, this contest has been the Naval Institute's flagship essay contest. The list of past winners reads like a who's who of famous naval thought leaders. Commander Alfred Thayer Mahan won the contest in its first year. Rear Admiral Stephen B. Luce, Lieutenant Ernest J. King, Lieutenant Commander, later Senator Sam Stratton, Captain Wayne Hughes, mentioned earlier, Lieutenant Commander Jim Stavridis, Commander James Sandy Winnefeld, and Rear Admiral William Jerry Holland are just a few of the winners whose names you'll recognize. The General Prize Essay Contest is funded by, the Andrew, by Andrew and Barbara Taylor and the Crawford Taylor Foundation, and we thank them for their proud and consistent sponsorship. Every year, this contest makes the point of a new slogan we've been saying in Beach Hall this year, which is, victory begins at the US Naval Institute. Like all essay contests, the General Prize Essay Contest is judged in the blind. And the editorial board members and the preceding staff this year were very happy to see when we opened the envelopes that this year's winners were all active duty authors. All three of them have contributed multiple times to the open forum. Two of them have won previous contests, and all three of their essays are published in the May issue of Proceedings, which there are uh, copies of here today. Uh, this year's third place winner of the General Prize Essay Contest is Lieutenant Brendan Cordial, United States Navy. Brendan is a surface warfare officer currently assigned to N96 in the Pentagon. His essay, People Over Payloads, is about the manning challenges that face today's Navy. A great quote from Brendan's essay is, no weapon or sensor system will ever be as modular, adaptable, or effective as the people who man our Navy ships. Brendan receives a medal, a check for $2,000, and a one-year extension to his membership in the Institute. Uh, good evening, all. I just want to say thank you briefly to uh, the USNI, obviously, for establishing the forum. Uh, I'm humbled to be up here. Congratulations to Captain Rylage and Lieutenant Stefanis uh, for their, uh, their great essays as well. Uh, and I'd like to uniquely thank Admiral Greenert. So on two points. Firstly, uh, he gave me the, the ammunition for my title. So a couple years ago, he wrote an article, uh, uh, Payloads Over Platforms essentially for modularity, uh, so I want to have the title without him. And secondly, uh, he, <coughs> he doesn't know this, uh, but he was our commissioning officer at the 2011 Notre Dame uh, commissioning ceremony, so I quite literally would not be here without you, sir. Uh, <laughs> and finally, uh, my beautiful wife, Sarah, she's not able to be here with me today, but I wanted to get on record thanking her for her love and support. Uh, <laughs> and for uh, uh, our small children at home. So uh, family, uh, thank you for being there for me. Thank you. This year's second place winner is Lieutenant Junior Grade Daniel Stephanus, United States Navy. Daniel is a surface warfare officer, currently assigned to Amphibious Squadron 6. His essay, There's Rot in Our Hulls, is a hard-hitting piece that argues that the Navy, quote, needs a hard reset and a bureaucracy stand down to rein in administrative redundancies and shutter unnecessary programs. You will recognize Lieutenant Stephanus because his essay, Embracing the Dark Battle, was the winner of last year's General Prize Essay Contest. Daniel receives a medal, a check for $3,000, and a one-year extension to his Naval Institute membership. It's an honor to be back on this stage for a second year. I'd like to thank the U.S. Naval Institute, especially Vice Admiral Daly and Fred Rainbow, 
uh, for all their support and mentorship over this last year. I'd also like to thank my friends Dmitry Filipov, Olivia Wassanis, and Melissa Ben, who are here tonight. Most of all, I'd like to thank my mom, uh, Janice, who is here today for her unending support of me and my love for the Navy. When I was nine years old, she asked me what I, where I wanted to go on vacation. And without hesitation, I said San Diego. I wanted to see the fleet. I vividly remember spotting a cruiser from our hotel and bolting down the stairs and across, bolting down the stairs and across the field to the water's edge as my mom asked where I was running to, and I yelled back, Mom, it's a Ticonderoga class cruiser. <laughs> <laughs> I watched it sail for as long as I could see it. I've never forgotten that moment, the pure joy of seeing a warship underway. From that love, I wrote, there's rot in our hulls. The McCain and the Fitzgerald were messengers and we cannot shoot the messengers. They told us of a fleet under strain, but the symptoms of those tragedies must not be conflated with root causes. Seven fleet is not the problem. It is only the fleet that has been pushed the hardest. The one that has been, that has been stress tested, revealing the structural weaknesses and the paradigms established in the 2000s. Seventh fleet is the canary in the coal mines. In my article, I discussed the three main layers of the Navy, their challenges and possible solutions, but at the core of the article is the, the idea that we need connection. We need to reconnect operational warfighters with the sense of purpose and a higher mission that drives the world's best teams. The Navy is not a grind to be endured. It is an opportunity to push back against the forces that menace the foundation of the free world. I've been involved with the CNO's Toughness Initiative for the last year doing design thinking workshops with commands across the waterfront, building resilient cultures. I've seen the same three concerns as we use the double diamond method to focus their feedback into meaningful critiques and solutions for their commanding officers. Those three themes, what is widely felt to be missing in our force, are open communication, sufficient training, and most crucially, respect. Everything is about war fighting, and we cannot build resili the resilience and tactical excellence requisite for high-end combat if we do not first address these fundamental needs. Now. We cannot bemoan our current structures. They were what we needed when we conceived of them in previous times of crisis, when all bold change is born. Instead, we must realign what we have to make it what we want. What are those missing mechanisms? Transparency, trust, and a shared commitment to critical self-improvement will help us locate those gaps and build the bridges we need to span them. I know we can achieve this, but it will require admitting some hard truths and tackling some tough questions. I challenge everyone in this room to be the change you want to see in our Navy. It's not an easy challenge, but nothing worth doing is easy. Thank you. Finally, the first place winner of this year's General Prize Essay Contest is Captain Dale Relog. Dale is a Naval Intelligence Officer and currently the Director of Intelligence and Information Warfare for the U.S. Pacific Fleet. His essay, How We Lost the Great Pacific War, is an exceptionally poignant memorandum written in the year 2025 from a future commander of the Pacific Fleet to a future Chief of Naval Operations. It is a bold essay with a lot of what we call the dare factor. Dale receives a gold medal, a check for $6,000 and an extension to his life membership, which I guess you, you go in perpetuity. That's right. Ladies and gentlemen, Dale Relag. So December 7, 1941, Admiral Husband Kimmel stood on the front lawn of what we now call Nimitz House and watched the Pacific Fleet burn. Uh, in my essay, I contemplate a future Pacific Fleet commander on the backside of that same historic home, contemplating the loss of the fleet in the waters of the Western Pacific. Um, I know since the issue posted yesterday, most of you probably haven't had a chance to read it, I'll tell you that one of my shipmates who read a draft and approved of it um, warned me it was going to generate strong reactions and quoted a fictional admiral chastising with a little gleam in his eye, an intelligence analyst appropriately enough, with the words, I told you to speak your mind, Jack, but Jesus. <laughs> As they warned me that this criticism might go beyond what was comfortable for a serving officer, at least one suggested I could deflect these critiques by describing what I wrote as hyperbole, unlikely and exaggerated extremes taken in order to make a point. I can't do that. 
I will tell you of the 24 articles I have written in the last couple of years, this was probably the easiest to write because it required so little imagination. What I can say is this, there is no foreordained future that the leadership of our Navy and increasingly outside of our Navy understands the challenges we're facing and is committed to get at them with urgency and honesty and that historically I console myself that when this Navy puts its mind to something, betting against us is usually a very bad idea. So with that, three quick thank yous. First, to Admiral Scott Swift, who has turned his time in command of the Pacific into a long and extended lab in servant leadership, battle-mindedness, and mission command. To Admiral John Richardson, who challenged us when he came in as CNO to read, write, and fight, and has provided us an example of excellence in all three, and has made the environment possible to have the challenging conversations that we need to have as an institution. And lastly, to the editorial board of proceedings, Fred Rainbow, Bill Hamlet, uh, and Admiral Daly. You said a couple years ago you wanted to up the dare factor. I'll tell you, authors will only dare if there's a publisher who will dare with them. And you have made proceedings in the Institute that for the C services again. And for that, all of us in uniform owe you our gratitude. Thank you. Well, I now have uh, a duty to announce something um, that I wish I didn't have to announce, uh, but that is that we learned last week that Fred Rainbow has decided to retire from the proceedings after 34 years working here. Fred, would you just join me on the stage for a moment? We didn't have enough time to put something really fabulous together, but we will put something really fabulous together. And I hope everybody in this room will join us probably on a soft summer evening on the deck over at Beach Hall, where we will appropriately spend the time to honor Fred Rainbow. But I could not let this annual meeting pass without A, informing the membership, because I think that is our responsibility, and secondly, to just take a moment and elucidate Fred's contributions to the Naval Institute, which are so dramatic that I would have to call on Clausewitz <laughs> and say that, yeah, and say that the definition of a center of gravity is that about which all else revolves. And Fred, for the four decades I've known you, you have been at the center, the beating heart of the Naval Institute. Publishers, even those as magnificent as Pete Daly, have come and gone. But Fred Rainbow <laughs> has been at the center through that period. I've known Fred in times of extreme crisis, when articles were published, when the dare factor was through the roof, <laughs> authors were gonna be fired, careers were gonna end. People like Lieutenant Commander Jim Stavridis was told he would never go back to sea again. And Fred has been with all of those authors in all of those times, through all of those difficulties, partly because he is a superb human being who defines friendship. I always say, I don't want friends who think for me. I want friends who make me think. That's Fred Rainbow. That's the kind of friend he is. And secondly, Fred has been at the center because he believes in the mission of this Naval Institute, which we have alluded to several times this afternoon, but in the end, it is about that open forum. That ability, as Kevin Iyer said, to span that space between lauding what we love and criticizing it to make it better. No one has been at the heart of that more than Fred Rainbow. Please get on your feet and thank Fred Rainbow.
Thanks. Thank you very much. Please sit down, and it's I who thank you. Um, two gentlemen I've known a long time took a chance with me to bring me back. I went into exile for nine years. Uh, so I came back and was given an opportunity to do the best job, or the, the best job is to be the editor of proceedings. Pete thinks he has it as CEO. That's the second best job. Uh, <laughs> no. So I got to meet Midshipman Stavridis. I got to meet Lieutenant Bob Gurrier. Uh, I got to meet a lot of people. Uh, but the secret sauce of the Naval Institute is the editorial board and the authors. Thank you. Thanks, Fred. And as I said, we will have a vastly more elaborate, vastly more well lubricated with alcohol, and vastly <laughs> more entertaining farewell for him uh, on the roof of Beach Hall. It now falls to me to introduce our principal speaker for this gathering, and it is my very good friend, Admiral John Richardson. John is as everybody knows, the current Chief of Naval Operations. He's had a remarkable career, including service as a Naval aide to the President, service in the legendary boat Parchi, uh, command of Honolulu, which won many, many awards, uh, went on to command subgroup eight in the Mediterranean, all submarine forces of NATO. John then was commander of all Naval Submarine Forces, and of course, chosen then to become Naval Reactors. And I will tell you, at that time, I was happy for Naval Reactors and I was sorry for the Navy. And what I mean by that is, it was clear to me that John Richardson's contributions as a Chief of Naval Operations would outstrip what he could do at Naval Reactors. I look at him as someone like a John Greenert, like a Gary Roughhead, like a Vern Clark. So I was thrilled to see him become our Chief of Naval Operations. He has done a magnificent job thus far, and the nation is not done with John Richardson. Join me in welcoming the CNO, John. Well, thank you very much uh, for that uh, hidden veiled threat. And, that, uh, <laughs> and uh, I think what Admiral Stavridis really meant to say is I've become an expert in tucking into the wake of John Greener. And that has been the key to success. I mean, you, you grab the right uh, guide on, and you can actually go pretty far in this biz business or this Navy. And so, uh, sir, it's great to see you again. And I will tell you uh, what a, uh, a fantastic uh, event to be here, 145 years here for the uh, Institute, Fred Rainbow with the, the, the entire time, I think, right? The, the, uh, <laughs> the original editor. And so it's really just a, a treasure uh, to be here and uh, to recognize. Uh, just another round of applause, I think, for Fred. So. <laughs> and um, I will tell you also, uh, you know, as we think about getting back into great power competition, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of, if you want a new idea, read an old book. Uh, a lot of our history, our heritage, those ideas that got us through uh, the last time we were in great power competition, particularly at sea, you know, resonant here in the work that the Naval Institute does. And so Pete and Fred and everybody just really want to thank you, Admiral, for, for all of that uh, that you do for us. And, you know, um, co-founded by Admiral Arlie Burke, right, As, or CSIS was, the, uh, where we are here. And so you see these, you know, bearing lines now beginning to cross. We have uh, <laughs> Dr. Rosenberg in the, in the, in the house. So I've, now I've got to watch out for everything I say about Arlie Burke here because uh, uh, nobody are expert. But I will tell you that, uh, you know, this idea, every time I think that we are gearing up and have changed our mindset towards great power competition, I just have to sort of read back the writings and 
and the thoughts of Arlie Burke to realize we have still some distance to go, right? Uh, we're not there quite yet. And so uh, this has been you know, the business of, of a couple of years and now validated by the national defense strategy and some other things that kind of confirm at a national level that we're in a great power competition. But if you just think uh, about some of the skills and uh, mindsets that got us through the last time, you really don't need to read much past uh, Arleigh Burke's standing orders, which directed his destroyers to attack on enemy contact without orders from the task force commander. And so as we think about what it means to be in command, uh, unit command, fleet command, et cetera, you know, in combat, uh, the accountability and responsibility that comes with that, I think that uh, going back and reading Admiral Burke's writings are, uh, uh, it's, it's a good medicine. It's good medicine to do that. Um, you know, he, appri he prized not only initiative, but also speed, right? He's got that famous quote that the uh, difference between a good naval officer and a poor one is 10 seconds, right? And uh, that's just a, if anything, that time has shrunk since uh, Admiral Burke said that. So. Okay, so uh, we, we come together for this event at a, a, what I would call a very fruitful time, okay? And uh, what I mean by that, it, it, well, first of all, let's just say, you know, he, us in the Navy, we in the Navy, we like to start by knowing where we are, and we generally figure out where we are by taking a fix. And since uh, we're all thinking about GPS denied environments and everything else these days, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to choose a celestial fix uh, to, to walk us through this evening. Okay, and uh, so we're going to pick three stars by which we're going to fix our position. And the first star will, that, you know, that will guide us uh, and define where we are right now, which I would again say is a great spot, is that uh, what we have great guidance, okay? Uh, we have a national security strategy and a national defense strategy that give us you know, a clear vision of where we're going. They call out in very clear terms you know, the type of competition that we're in, the priorities uh, by which we're going to guide our investments, our efforts. And so this, you know, it's been some time since we've had something this clear and particularly this idea of, hey, we are in this with, you know, a competition with great powers. And so that is, you know, one thing that defines our position, right? The first arc, if you will, from that star. Now, second, um, by virtue of the great work of uh, the department and the Congress working together, we have an opportunity where we have some resources, predictable, adequate resources, that thing for which we've been asking for some time, and we have to kind of make hay and do the very best work that we can uh, to make sure that we have something to show for this great effort. That was not easy, right? And uh, you just have to sort of listen to the testimony of both you know, folks in the, uh, on the executive side of that effort and on the legislative side to know that everybody kind of came out with some skin knees, skin elbows, some bruises, uh, everybody on all sides, and uh, that's usually the, the sign of a pretty good deal, right? We, everybody really went to the mat, and so we need to make sure that we execute that, uh, certainly in a way that every one of those dollars is traceable to something that contributes to increasing our competitiveness in this great power context, okay? So we have resources. That's another great uh, arc to define our position. And then finally, we've got, I think, very aligned leadership. Right, from the Secretary on down, Secretary of Defense, Deputy Secretary of Defense, the acquisition, research and development teams, uh, the Secretary of the Navy, all of it sort of aligned to provide you know, clear direction and, and impetus to uh, move forward in all of these. So by virtue of these three things, we're in a great spot. We are in, fair in the channel and, and in deeper, better water than we've been in for some time. So what are we gonna do with that? Well, as you, know, you might have heard me describe in some you know, recently, we're focusing all of our efforts on building what we call the Navy that the nation needs, all right? And uh, 
I'll leave you know, the details of that, the deep details of that, maybe for the question and answer period, because I really want to get to get a sense of what's on your mind and, and answer your questions. But it really breaks down at its simplest form into sort of three dimensions. Right? We've done, in the, in the two years leading up to this position, we uh, did a lot of studies inside the Navy. Uh, we had, there were a number of studies done outside the Navy. And all of those studies came uh, to the conclusion, that, you know, a pretty tight consensus, that uh, in order to execute its responsibilities to the nation so that America can execute its, uh, pl you know, achieve its place in the world, the, we, we need more naval power, right? And that's expressed in a number of different ways. One way is the size of the Navy. And there was a good convergence in terms of the size that uh, the Navy should be about 350, 360 ships or more to meet our responsibility. And that is now the law of the land that the Navy will have 355 ships. And that's subject to a couple of important caveats like authorization and appropriations. Uh, but, uh, you, know, that's, that, you know, that's a compelling statement. Not, but, you know, capacity is one uh, dimension of naval power, uh, but we also need, you know, capability. We need a better Navy, okay? And so this idea of, you know, what can we do to make each one of our platforms, you know, more capable, more lethal, more effective, more competitive in this great power context, uh, there's a lot of different things that we're bringing and, you know, technology really on the cusp of some defining technologies that will greatly enhance uh, the capability of each one of those platforms. And then finally, you know, that's all sort of potential power until we go out and we make it ready. And so we need a ready Navy. And there's been a lot of discussion about recovering, enhancing, uh, building the readiness of the Navy as we, uh, as we go forward and we find ourselves in this great power competition with some resources to do some meaningful work and uh, with the leadership that's you know, guiding us down this road uh, with some urgency. And so that's really sort of the dimensions of the Navy that the nation needs. Uh, it is bigger, it is better, and it is ready. Okay? Um, I'll just you know, bring it to a quick close because I know uh, the Q&A is always the fun part here. Um, you know, again, uh, as we embark down this course, uh, we're going to be mindful of you know, looking back, right? Learning the lessons from history. And uh, in fact, uh, it was one of the things that uh, we did in partnership with the Naval Institute was to commission the CNO's essay contest, which was fo focused exactly on that question, right? What lessons can we glean from history that can uh, inform us uh, today in this modern version of great power competition. And the, uh, we sort of had two levels of competition. We had the pros, and then we had you know, sort of the, uh, the hobbyists, I guess, or you know, those who are not professional historians. The professional essay uh, contest was won by a Navy Lieutenant Commander, Joel Holwitt, and he did a terrific essay on uh, the lessons from the interwar period, uh, what the Navy learned. And in fact, you know, what a great, you know, uh, lesson for all of us to take on board is study that period in history. Uh, and, but he was very thoughtful. He, you know, this was not sort of a carbon copy of that era. There were a number of things that have fundamentally shifted. And we need to be mindful of that if we're going to be effective here. Uh, we're going to do another essay. And the Institute's been uh, very kind to partner with us again. Uh, I think we had uh, about almost 300, just shy of 300. So we're going to have to set a new record, 450 or something, essay inputs, and, uh, and so we'll move forward. But, um, you know, another five-star admiral, Admiral Leahy, uh, made it very clear that the study and knowledge of history are absolutely essential to survival and success at sea. And so I look forward to having fixed our position in such a great spot right now, moving out at flank speed down a course that we can all agree on. Thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Yeah. On both sides here. Ma'am. All right. Uh, 
Admiral Richardson, I am Anthea Germano from Altoona, Pennsylvania, who is here representing Congressman Bill Schuster, who sits on the House Armed Services Committee. Mm -hmm. He wanted me to give you the message that he appreciates and thanks you for the wonderful job you are doing as Chief of Naval Operations. Keep up the good work, Godspeed, and on a personal note, I would like to thank you for your service. Well, thank you very much, all right. So, <laughs> thank you. Please thank the congressman as well. Uh, okay, so now that we got the hard questions out of the way. <laughs> Sir. Jerry Holland, uh, <coughs> retired submariner. Would you uh, address the issue of uh, of uh, conversations going on in the top part of the Navy, uh, using as your, your uh, basis the fine article by Captain Eiler and the mea culpa by Admirals Muffin, um, uh, Malo, uh, <laughs> Admiral Natter, and, uh, okay, no. it's an old man's problem. that we're in the last uh, issue yeah. of the proceedings. Well, I'll tell you that, um, yeah, I, I just wanna be the absolute last one to second guess the decisions made by you know, people in the past. Uh, they're absolutely brilliant people uh, that confronted situations and made the best decision uh, that, that we could at the time. Uh, but neither do I wanna say that we can't continue to improve. So one of the things that's been, I hope, a hallmark of the Navy uh, you know, for 242 years is that we're, uh, a, you know, a pretty fast learning organization. And you know, a lot of people kind of they uh, they challenge us in that regard, right? And um, it, they, uh, I guess, accuse us of moving a little bit slower than we need to. Uh, but you know, one of the very first things I did uh, when I was before I was fired as the director of naval reactors was uh, I gave a uh, speech uh, to mark the inactivation of the USS Enterprise, okay? And uh, this is the USS Enterprise coming back home to inactivate after 52 years of service to the nation. And just to give you a sense of where, you know, how much things have changed, uh, when Enterprise was launched in 1960, she was the biggest power plant in the world uh, the biggest ship in the world. And as she made her way down the James River, people lined the banks of the river because, you know, deep, right? Many, many layers deep because everybody wanted to see this magnificent ship move, move down the river and out to sea. Her first mission was Cuban Missile Crisis, right? She was built and designed as a Cold War uh, you know, ship, warship, um, really to respond to you know, the Soviet moves, you know, particularly uh, in space, right? We, with Sputnik and stuff, the, the nuclear-powered warship business was a strategic response to, uh, to the Soviets in that regard. And so she was sent right down to the Cuban Missile Crisis. That was her first mission. Uh, move now 52 years later, okay? She had participated and been relevant and contributed significantly to so many different contingencies, wars, crises, humanitarian disasters, uh, through some of the fastest changing times in our nation's history, where you know, first in the Cold War, including time off of Vietnam, then the wall comes down, rapidly adapts, it was the ship that turned around, it was the first to respond, to the uh, attack on 9-11 and uh, reconfigured now to uh, the attack, uh, or the, the war on violent extremism, all along the way, uh, adapting to humanitarian relief and everything else that came her way. So in the spirit of you know, rapid adapting, rapid learning, we are continuing to do that. And so to get to your question finally, um, yeah, there are a number of things, a number of opportunities, I would say, that we are taking a look at in terms of enhancing our preparation and readiness for command, 
okay? And that's, if I was going to define a single nexus, it would be on you know, the uh, celebration of command, and particularly the celebration of command in great power competition and what that means, okay? So for all of our commanding officers, future commanding officers, in each of our warfare areas, you know, what does that mean? How does that career pipeline prepare them for command? Uh, from the very basic training, those first, tour, first tours at sea, what do we do when we come ashore, the training we get before we go back to command, all along the way with rigorous assessments to make sure that we're meeting standards from uh, your very first junior officer tour as an ensign all the way to the last time you do command. Okay, so there's that. Uh, there are plenty of opportunities also to enhance the personal preparation uh, for command with uh, team preparation, okay? So on each of those bridge teams, each of those teams in uh, CIC, and all of those engineering, all of the teams that go towards uh, combat effectiveness at the unit level. And then to take that up to the fleet level, okay? So we're really kind of, by virtue of the individual investigations into each of the incidents that we saw last year, the comprehensive review, strategic readiness review, uh, the GAO reports that had something to say about this. We, we've got this comprehensive plan, fairly uh, broad, uh, but marching forward uh, briskly. Uh, we think that we're gonna have uh, uh, about 80% of all of the recommendations done in fiscal year 18, and then it's, you know, looking past that, to make sure that we've properly diagnosed the problem, have applied the right you know, uh, medicine, and that we're actually seeing things get better. There's an assessment piece on the back. So I, ho I hope I got to the answer of your question there at some point and uh, addressed what Captain Eiler and Admiral's uh, speech. What's that? It was a good speech. Okay, there you go. All right, thanks. <laughs> All right. He's a submariner. He's like, shut up. I, I got my answer. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, Admiral. Um, I'm Michael Romero, an interpreter with Colonial Williamsbury, actually. I'm on a daily basis finding myself in a position to teach the public those lessons from history back in the early days leading to the birth of the American Navy. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, to make it more specific, usually when someone's waiting in line to talk to George Washington, I'm the knucklehead with a sextant trying to teach them to take a noon sighting. Okay, well, there you um, go. But uh, my question is, is how could someone in a position like my own or something similar uh, help encourage the public towards supporting the Navy in its uh, uh, next steps? I'll tell you what, you could do no better than to read the products of the Naval Institute and <laughs> translate those into all of those public opportunities you have to speak. Yes. Is, that, is that fair enough? Certainly. All right, thank you so much. All right. Thank you. As you know, Robbie Harris, a uh, former naval person. Um, I believe it was Secretary F. Mattis who has said something like this, that we should be strategically predictable, but operationally unpredictable. Strategically, I think we can be very predictable now. There's the national security strategy, there's the national defense strategy, which, which makes very clear, just as you mentioned earlier, what our strategy is. Yeah. But I guess my question to you, sir, is what are we, Navy, doing to be less operationally predictable? Yeah. It seems to me from a distance that we, the deployments are still the same. We're going to the same places with the same number and types of ships. Mm -hmm. are, are we looking at operational, being operationally less predictable? So this is in the four or five months since the NDS has come out. We haven't uh, <laughs> achieved a... Yeah, in the future, in fact, there are a number of things that are on the table. And uh, if you've, uh, well, I'm sure you have, uh, Robbie, this idea of um, dynamic force employment and all of those things that I think are, you know, unpredictability is one thing, but it's not just unpredictability for its own sake, right? It's unpredictability to enhance our competitive position. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, you know, it's got to be thoughtful in terms of what does this, uh, impose in terms of costs on our competitors. And so a lot of those ideas are, uh, are cooking around. I'm hoping you'll see some uh, results of that uh, coming soon to a theater near you. Good. Thank you very much. All right, thanks. Yeah, Megan. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about your idea of great power competition. Um, so looking at the recent strikes on Syria, 
they were kind of interesting in that you had multiple Navy platforms, you had two different fleets, uh, sixth and fifth involved, you had joint assets, you had international assets. And I was wondering just kind of how that type of operation compares to what you envision for a uh, great power competition and maybe what lessons could be learned from that. Uh, yeah, no, it's a great uh, question. And, um, you know, some of the specifics are obviously, you know, not appropriate for this venue. But uh, what I would say is that uh, there are a lot of things a lot of elements of that operation that are going to be those things that we want to continue to stress, right? So certainly the uh, work with partners and allies, you know, a fundamental pillar of the national defense strategy. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you what, that uh, came together uh, to do this sophisticated kinetic strike, uh, you know, pretty quickly, right? And so it is sort of a validation of the investment that we've been making over decades, really, with our partners and allies uh, which, you know, include uh, not only uh, exercises and, and that sort of thing, but also, you know, we go to each other's schools. We form these strategic partnerships so that, you know, when fleet commanders call each other up, they know each other by first name. They've, you know, they know each other's families, et cetera, et cetera. So this idea of trust and confidence, uh, and, you know, Admiral Stab Reed is the master of this when he was uh, over in Europe in terms of building those relationships upon which we'll lean on as we go forward. And so that was one element. And then, you know, that moving down into the levels of interoperability so that we could bring together an op board of that type, uh, you know, do uh, collaboration where we, where we wanted to, uh, deconfliction, all of that, uh, you know, very, very quickly uh, came together uh, and again, just validated the, uh, the investment in those areas. Now, so a lot of that we want to, we want to persist as we move forward. Having said all that, it, you know, it was by design a surgical operation, okay? And I think that uh, time has borne out that it met its surgical intent uh, very, very uh, precisely. Um, we're looking in the Navy at, okay, let's, let's leverage that success. Let's springboard off of that success rewind the tape from the very first inkling of that operation, uh, cast that in light of great power, prolonged competition, what would we do different, okay? What would we need, what capabilities would we need to have in place uh, to not only build up and conduct that strike, but then to get back into the fight and conduct the next one and the next one after that? and uh, you know, do this now uh, under a much more opposed type of uh, scenario. And so this is the type of thinking that uh, I love you know, leveraging off success. And then how would you take that success and make it even more successful in a, in a more high, a higher end, uh, more sustained, prolonged type of a scenario? Okay, Thank you. thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hey, Admiral Tim Oliver, retired Navy captain. Uh, with the all-volunteer military, we're getting to the point where we have multiple generations of Navy families who are serving in our Navy. And I'm wondering if you're concerned as we try and grow the size of the Navy and the cost of the Navy, that we're doing enough to be able to engage with the general public yeah. and get them involved. Yeah, uh, well, to quickly answer your final question, the answer is I don't think we can do enough, right? And so to give, put a number on what you just mentioned, it's about 85% of our Navy it comes from a family that is in some way uh, service oriented, okay? That's a lot, right? That's a strong generational, uh, you know, le uh, bias, I suppose. And, uh, and, you know, we're out doing the things that we need to do. Uh, so operationally, we're getting it done with that team and they're amazingly dedicated. We can talk about that. Uh, but I'll tell you, there's sort of two things that uh, concern me uh, one is kind of the state of civil military relations. And as we become more and more in you know, separate lanes, uh, it, it's something that we need to sort of double down on our outreach so that we are fully understanding one another uh, to the point where we, you know, I mean, I'm ready to be sort of questioned and challenged a little bit more uh, in, an, in an intellectual way, right? And so. This, is, this civil military dialogue, I think, is a really important thing to do. How we do that is, uh, is challenging. And so, uh, 
we have to be careful about uh, how we describe this, but you know, for everybody in here, kind of going back to the question uh, from the gentleman from Williamsburg, you know, I wouldn't make any assumptions that because we are all fervent readers of proceedings and are up to speed and very familiar with naval operations and military operations, I wouldn't make any assumptions that our chambers of commerce and our PTAs and all of those people uh, are as familiar as we are. And uh, you know, we need to not only do the reading and understand what we want to say, but then we got to go say it. Right? We've got to actively find venues. And this, I think, is a, uh, a challenge of national urgency as we move forward into this you know, potentially much more challenging uh, era of competition. And then the other one is just the sheer numbers. That's the second concern. And so as we build towards a bigger Navy, 355 ships, um, we're going to have to think about how we man those ships uh, in a different way, right? And so we're not going to be able to man them with the number of sailors that we have right now per ton or whatever. Uh, we just, uh, you know, we'll run out of people before we uh, get there. So a couple of different dimensions to your question. Thank you, Admiral. Yeah. Good evening, yeah. Admiral Tension, Great Sevenus. You actually just hit on part of my question. Uh, as we significantly increase the number of sailors and ships in a time of complicated readiness, what are we doing to avoid, doing to avoid historic problems with growing pains, making sure that we aren't weakening ourselves in this transitionary period, given this era of great, comp great power competition? Yeah. How would you describe growing pains, if I could just uh, <laughs> seek to understand your question better? So, so, so basically this idea, so like you were just talking about, we can't have as many sailors, potentially, uh, so it's this idea of, let's say you have 20 more ships, mm -hmm. how do you make sure that you have the same quality of sailor per ship? Yeah. Or also this idea of if you're extending, for instance, destroyers, if you're going to make it you know, 40 or 45 years per hull for the, yeah. the DDGs, how do you make sure that they're actually able to keep that same level of readiness given yeah. problems you had with okay. the LSDs and extending right. the Right. So one thing that uh, is a, uh, a very important feature of this idea of the Navy the nation needs, which is our kind of our tagline, mm -hmm. is that... Uh, uh, if there is one word that uh, characterizes it more than any other, it's balance, mm -hmm. okay? And we have seen, uh, I think all of us have seen to some degree and some dimension what happens when we get a little bit out of balance. Mm -hmm. And uh, in general, what happens is that, you know, mistakes that are made at my level in terms of creating an imbalance, you know, the, uh, the price of that mistake goes right down to Admirals Davidson and Swift mm -hmm. as they try and you know, navigate or reconcile this imbalance mm -hmm. there at the waterfront. Mm -hmm. And it becomes very, very hard to do that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if some of these things are kind of intrinsic in the program's design. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of balance is something that we're sticking to uh, almost religiously. And uh, so I talked about bigger, better, ready. Mm -hmm. uh, at your level, we can talk about sort of the six pillars mm -hmm. that flesh out bigger, better, ready in a, in a more full way. Mm -hmm. But it's really maintaining the balance of all those. So for instance, if I, as I build towards 355 ships, uh, well, sure, there's going to be uh, a new construction part of that. Mm -hmm. And in budget language, that's going to be an SCN uh, plus up, OK? Mm -hmm. Uh, but there's got to be a corresponding now to uh, expression of the total ownership cost of that. And mm -hmm. so what is the fuel that I need to lay in? What, where, where is the money for, to hire the crew, mm -hmm. uh, the infrastructure so I can moor that ship and power that ship, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so this idea of balance, we, we've got to stick to those guns, right? Mm -hmm. Because every one of those pillars has a constituency, and they're going to lock in on, hey, let's just do this part of it. And uh, as we achieve balance against a, uh, you know, a, a given top line, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the uh, single constituencies may be dissatisfied that we aren't moving as forward in their area as fast as we could mm -hmm. if we marshaled all the resources and stuck it in one dimension. But we've got to maintain that balance going forward. Would you slow, slow implementation then, sir, if you felt that readiness was falling too fast for the expansion? Uh, I would do everything I could to maintain balance and yes, move sir. as fast as possible <laughs> in a Thank balanced you, way, <laughs> Ooh, nice. quickly, but balanced, like a bicycle racer. <laughs> OK. All right. Over here. Admiral, thank you, sir. Uh, Rafael Ortiz, Coast Guard Reserve, retired.
two issues or, or items I'd like either to consider or comment on, uh, maybe that are on your radar, maybe not. One of them is, relates to what's been brought up here twice now. Our connection to the United States people itself, uh, and that connection becomes even more di divided uh, every single day. You're saying that most of our military members now joining are connected already to the military. I would submit to you that the, your reserve component is probably your best bet to connect to the civilian population. They're the people who have born, raised, lived, and sometimes die in their community. Given that, it seems that the Navy historically over the last 20 years has pulled away from the center of the country by taking the reserve centers away, by uh, no longer naming ships after certain cities or connecting that to the population. I would submit to you or ask you, has that been a consideration to maybe look at the reserve component and create a better tie or a more closer connection so that uh, people are connected to the service through their, uh, yeah. through the people who are working with day to day? Right. Are you in the reserves? Retired. Okay. So, uh, one, I. I just see that just a little bit different than you do. Uh, our fastest, you know, built ship, the littoral combat ship, they're all being named for cities. And uh, many of those cities are right from America's heartland. And, so, and we do that because we do treasure that relationship with the cities in each one of those things. Uh, you know, our attack submarine force, uh, largely named for cities and states. So I think we've got a pretty good uh, track record in terms of the ship naming uh, aspect of your question. Uh, where we are getting tremendous, tremendous value from our reserves, and you know, we have a very unique approach to reserves, which I think is a, a national treasure, something we need to preserve, is uh, we are reaching out and getting a much better understanding of not only the communities and everything that uh, our reserve folks come from, but also what skills they bring. And some of those skills are exactly the skills that we need inside the Navy. You know, cyber security, cyber skills, those sorts of things. Uh, contracting, you know, all of those things that make a big difference to the way that we do things. And uh, we're also now seeing a great drive from our reserve sailors to actually go to sea, right? And go and, and fill spots on crews. Uh, they've always been terrific and surging forward and uh, manning staffs in response to a crisis. In fact, they're, they're better than some of our active duty staffs in that regard because we exercise them uh, so much more. And so I see the reserves as a really rich part of our Navy. I, don't, I see it getting stronger every day. Admiral Luke McCollum is our uh, Chief of Naval Reserves. He's locked in on this like a laser. And, uh, but you know, I take your point that we could maybe uh, benefit a little bit more. We could ask more of our reserves when they go back to their communities and uh, you know, put the uniform away for a little while to get out there and be part of this messaging campaign. The other thing about this civil military uh, part, which is interesting and something that maybe the Institute and uh, we can look at together, is that uh, we, have to be, we have to take a long view back, right? And it, uh, it just occurs to me that uh, when we talk about the percentage of uh, public servants who have military experience, and you hear this expressed in a number of different ways, members of Congress or me members of the government have less experience in the military than they did you know, in the 50s and 60s. We have to remember that you know, we just mobilized just about everybody in World War II, right? And uh, that's a bit of a historical anomaly. And if you look over our long history, I think we're actually a little bit closer to the historical norm now than we were, you know, in the post World War II and Korean War era, and uh, and the, you know the Navy and the nation and and the civil military relationship did okay, you know, for those uh, 200 years or so, and so we just maybe have to take some lessons from that. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right, sir. Hi, um, uh, I'm Ahmad. I'm a student who just has a history uh, interest in naval affairs, and um, so forgive me if this question isn't appropriate for this venue, but. I was reading an article recently. If you have to say that, I can maybe say you some time. <laughs> I, I was reading an article recently about the, um, the outline for the large surface combatant, the potential replacement for the Ticonderoga class cruiser. And I was 
sort of interested that one of the focus areas for the design was modularity, the ability to swap out radar, weapons, other systems very quickly. And given that the difficulties faced by the Navy in developing the littoral combat ship, mm -hmm. and how all those difficulties stemmed from the modularity requirements, do you think the Navy has learned the lessons from that program to apply to the large surf and combatant and to other ship development programs in the future? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right. Over here. All right. Now I'll tell you. I'll, let me elaborate on that just a bit. Um, no, the answer it truly is yes. And in fact, we're learning within the littoral combat ship program, right? And so when uh, we thought about modules. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this was not just for LCS, but uh, we were thinking about these for submarines and a lot of, you know, there was a lot of uh, attraction to the adaptability of a modularized uh, approach to shipbuilding, right? So you could kind of put a plug in and that plug would be uh, tailored to a particular mission. Then as things change, you could, you could put another plug in that's tailored to a different type of mission. Um, what's happened in the interim is that, uh, you know, technology has taken off and so you can, the density, you know, the capability per cubic yard is uh, so much higher now that we can take a much more granular approach to modularity. And so rather than think about modules that come, you know, with a gigantic crane get poked in and that sort of thing, we can really think about modularity in terms of quickly swappable arrays. Uh, it, it, rapidly improving processing. You know, uh, software is a big part of this, is a progressive. And so I don't think of it so much as modularity as I think about it as a ship that's designed from the keel up to uh, not only uh, house this, uh, you know, combat system in a hull that will last the life of the ship, the power plant will likely last the better part of the life of the ship. That's hard to change. But the rest of it will follow the curve of technology on a much more agile basis. Not so much in modular ways, but designed in its DNA to improve uh, very rapidly. Okay? Admiral Greenard had this idea. This is uh, his platforms and payloads idea, right, that you published when you were the CNO. So we're just kind of lever It's that whole wake thing, right? <laughs> I just tuck into the wake. <laughs> hey, Chris. Hi, sir. Uh, Chris Cavus, and I know you know me from uh, many years of covering the Navy, but I have to say that uh, a few months ago I got one of these nice phone calls from Admiral Daly. I'm actually now a Golden Life member of the Naval Institute. So I come oh, to you today you go, as a member. Okay. Thank you. So I come today to do today as a as a member here. Okay, well, I've um, got to show you some new level of respect now. That's uh, uh, sure. Why your not? honor, your eminence. Okay, so. Admiral Daly, in the, in the um, April proceedings issue, uh, addressed the, the, this issue of non-transparency that I know you're familiar with. And he yeah. referenced your memo of March uh, 2017. He references a recent memo from the Deputy Defense, uh, Defense Secretary, references the Air Force public affairs situation. And he wrote that, you know, policies such as this reinforce the notion that the best way to get ahead is to keep your head down. It will reward those who shoot low and avoid risk, ultimately undermining DOD's efforts to innovate and address head-on the very complex and difficult challenges it faces. If good people are engaging, or if good people stop engaging with the public, it could be as dangerous or more dangerous than oversharing. Mm -hmm. So there's this whole issue where you have you you have this element of non-transparency of non. You don't want to talk about capabilities. There's a lot of specific names you've, that have been directed not to be talked about. Yeah. Um, there are operations that are not to be talked about. Um, and throughout the Navy establishment, there's, an, there's a dense, thick chill in terms of talking about anything of substance. People are essentially terrified to speak out. Yeah. Terrified. Um, I would say terrified, yes. Terrified for their job, yes. And in some cases, terrified for the future of the Navy and the country. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that that's yeah. hyperbole. And so you, but this plays out on multiple levels. Chris, you, I am. And so, so you have a, you have a personal situation now with Admiral O'Coin. In the, in the pages of proceedings comes out and talks about all these issues he's had with Fleet Forces Command that led to the issues in Seventh Fleet. 
Apparently he didn't feel comfortable with talking about these things as an active duty officer. Now that he's retired, now that he's out, it's okay. There's another issue well, about, uh, about... Have you talked to Admiral Al Cohen? Is that I, cause I have effect not. There? I've, I've, okay. But, okay. Just. Is so, there, uh, I heard you say today at, at, at your press conference... Which you were not there for. Well, I'm not doing that, but I watched, on, I watched online, and I heard the question about, do you think people are... Is, is this an atmosphere where, where people can speak out? Yeah. And you and the secretary both emphatically said yes. Where people so, can speak out. Where people can speak yeah. out. How does that square with how so many people feel? And what Admiral Daly wrote. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, I think it's really about, I'm going to go back to this idea of balance, all right? And uh, we do need to be mindful that uh, there are certain things, and I was pretty specific in my uh, memo to talk about warfighting capabilities of systems, future operations of naval forces that are just have never been appropriate to talk about in a public forum. And uh, as we enter this idea of this uh, great power competition, uh, continue to be inappropriate to talk. Uh, now, if we want to talk about the Navy the nation needs, the role of the Navy in, in preserving this maritime nation, uh, certainly all of the subjects that we've talked about today, I think all of that is on the table, and people have you know, the green light to talk about all of that. It's really just a uh, small uh, grouping of things that really have never been appropriate to talk about, and uh, we just, it was a reminder that uh, we need to be mindful of doing that, okay? And then it, it really, I think, uh, finished with an encouragement that this does not excuse us, uh, particularly senior leadership, of getting out and expressing our, our thoughts. And you know, the other thing that I've, uh, I've been pretty clear on is that uh, you know, this is national security. This is an NFL level game. And so if you're gonna go out and you're gonna talk, make sure you know what you're gonna say. Uh, make sure that if you're speaking on behalf of the Navy, you actually are, and uh, those sorts of things. And so you know, with those, few guidance, you know, that bit of guidance, uh, people are, are cleared hot to talk. All right? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, CNO. And uh, we definitely appreciate uh, you coming tonight, having the service chief for one of the three C services as the speaker for the annual meeting makes this meeting more meaningful. And we thank you. And I wanna mention a story. Well, just a few months after I took over the, as the CEO, got an email from Vice Admiral Richardson who was the commander of the submarine force. And he said, you know, I want my lieutenants to have a certain book, Rules of the Game by Andrew Gordon. And it was a cautionary note about how an organization that was at the peak of its warfighting effectiveness around the time of Trafalgar with Nelson had evolved over 100 years and it had many lessons, many lessons that affect us today and have a applicability today, especially as we mount a campaign uh, to be on step for the great power competition that the CNO talked about. I thought it was worthy to mention that he personally subvented uh, the, bringing that book back to the Naval Institute. Uh, we contacted the author, Andrew Gordon, in the UK, and he, he gave us, he reverted the rights to us to print that book. So um, we appreciate your um, engagement and your involvement uh, well before you were CNO. And I also wanna say, uh, in the case of Fred Rainbow, uh, because the, it wasn't, uh, I wasn't able to say this and during my remarks, uh, is that there's a great quote that's attributed to uh, Winston Churchill, and it's highly disputed, by the way. There's a lot of people that think he never said it, but it's so good, I'm gonna use it. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he said, you make a living by what you get, but you make a life by what you give. And Fred Rainbow has given his entire adult life effort, almost entire, to the Naval Institute. And he's been a, a right-hand man for us 
and I thank him and acknowledge him as well. Thank you, Fred. And on that note, and on that note, our 145th annual meeting comes to an end. I want to thank everybody who came, our members, especially our new members, um, our guests, our board members, and all of the authors. I want to congratulate them again for their terrific accomplishments. When I hear them talk, I think we are on the right path. You can't help but be impressed by, uh, by those authors. So we thank them and we thank our sponsors once again, who is, uh, who is USAA, Leonardo, and Lockheed Martin. And we invite everybody here to join us for the reception and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.